Today's episode of the Believe in Steelers show is brought to you by BetOnline.ag. Week four of the NFL season is almost in the books. We've got a Monday night matchup. If you want to place a bet on any of the NFL action all season long, BetOnline.ag is the place to do it. So here's what you need to do. You go to BetOnline.ag, use your mobile device, desktop, computer, use our promo code Believe50. That's B-L-E-A-V-5-0. It's on your screen right now to get hooked up with your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit bet online where the game starts all right cue the music it's time to start the show Welcome to the Believe in Steelers show on the Believe Network. I'm your host, Mark Bergen. Joined today by fellow Believe, Believe Podcast Network host, Andrew Golden. He is with the Believe in Jets show. Ike Taylor is off. He's scouting out in California. It's part of his scouting duties with the Pittsburgh Steelers. But Andrew, welcome in. Thank you for filling in. I'm sure you're in a lot better mood this Monday than I am. <laughs> and I got to ask, have the Jets reached out to you yet to play offensive tackle? Because they're really beat up along that offensive line. Uh, no, they haven't hit my phone yet. Uh, if they want Zach Wilson to be standing upright for the majority of this season, I would say that they go ahead and not do that. Um, as bad as the Jets offensive line has been, I promise I would be worse. Uh, so for Zach Wilson's sake and for my own health and safety, let's just not do that. All right. You're very humble and very gracious. Again, Andrew Golden, we'll say the better half of the Believe in Jets, one of two uh, host of that show. He does a great job. Lamont Jordan as well. So I would encourage any of our listeners here on Believe in Steelers to go check them out. And again, thank you for coming on today to break down this game at Akershire Stadium in Pittsburgh. Uh, I'll say this, the silver lining for Steelers fans, the Kenny Pickett era is underway. Finally, we've waited for it. I correctly predicted that he would play in this game. And I'll say this, at least he gave the Steelers a chance. And I'm going to say this too, Andrew. Not all interceptions are created equal. And he had three interceptions. There was one that was really costly late in the fourth quarter. But all in all, I think that the Steelers' offense moved the ball. There was a lot more energy. Like, from a Jets perspective, did you, did you want Trubisky to stay in the game? Because the Steelers' offense was extremely stagnant in the first half. Oh, yeah, I absolutely was hoping Trubisky would stay in the game uh, with how the game was going through the first half. And, and you said it right there at the end, Mark, energy. You could just see that the Steelers stadium was uh, was dead through the first half. The Jets got out to a 10 nothing lead early, and it seemed like all hope was lost. Trubisky was the quarterback, and nothing was going to improve. As soon as Kenny Pickett came on the field, all it took for him was converting a quarterback sneak on a fourth and one, and the stadium erupted. And I think on top of that, you saw that the team really rallied around him as well. They were able to generate more pl uh, push in the run game. Kenny Pickett was making plays with his legs to keep drives going as well. He had two rushing touchdowns. And you really saw that entire team, stadium, fan base, sideline, everything really kind of come alive and have a shot in the arm once Kenny Pickett got in the lineup. I think that really says something. And I don't think the Steelers even make the comeback that they did to where they were in the point to surrender it at the end without Kenny Pickett coming in the game. I'm with you there, and I say not all interceptions are created equal. The first pass that he throws is in the interception, a 50-50 ball to Chase Claypool. He's six foot four. I'm actually okay with that. That almost served like an arm punt. Now, the interception that you have to avoid is when you have a lead late in the fourth quarter. Defensive back Michael Carter, the second, makes a diving interception. It was a great play, but that's just a ball you cannot throw, and that's something where – Mitch has been a lot more conservative in the four games that he's played, probably doesn't make that throw. And Kenny Pickett even said after the game in his news conference that that's just a pass you cannot make in that situation. And the Jets take advantage coming back from a 10-point deficit. Yeah, absolutely. I think for, for Pickett in particular, that's, that's going to be a learning situation where he threw it late. He's going to the sideline. He's got Fryer Muth on Sauce Gardner on a second and 15, I believe it was. And he's going through his progressions off the snap. He gets a little bit of pressure. Pocket's closing in. And he sees Fryer Muth late to his right, and he throws it late. And that gives Sauce an opportunity to recover. It, he messes up the throw uh, or the 
the catch, by, I should say, when he's coming in, closing on Fryermuth, ball's high, Fryermuth tips it up in the air, and Carter the second's able to come over and catch it for the interception. That's just going to be the learning moment for Kenny Pickett, is the next time that happens, just throw the ball in the stance. That you yeah. you don't need to be trying to force that ball in on second and 15. Yes, you have a lead, but you know, taking time off the clock, getting into third and medium or third and 15 and punting and taking the Jets even further away than they were, that's going to be best case scenario. Um, but that's what you can expect of a rookie quarterback in his first start who didn't practice to start all week. And that's the other thing to remember with Kenny Pickett is that he wasn't taking first team reps and practice this Trubisky was. So he's been preparing, coming in, not getting the same sort of chemistry with this first string offense. And that's when you're going to have miscues like we saw on that interception. But that's not, like you said, not all interceptions are created equally. I didn't see anything from Kenny Pickett in this game that made me go, oh my God, he shouldn't be playing. Or, or anything that made me think that he that this was too big of a moment for him or that he wouldn't be able to be capable of, of succeeding. I was quite honestly very impressed with what I saw from Kenny Pickett. And that play included, even though it was a bad ball, that's a rookie mistake that pretty much every rookie quarterback in league history has made, and you expect him to iron it out in the future. And this is coming from an outsider perspective. Again, Andrew Golden, the host of Believe in Jets as well. And this is why I'm happy to have you on because we get sometimes – Two inside baseball when you're covering just one team. Sometimes you need that outsider perspective to see that. And to me, again, it was the energy that was just different. That third interception at the end of the game, Hail Mary, I'm not going to fault any quarterback for giving his team a chance at the very end of the game. So that was his third interception. Andrew, I got to point this out, though. 10 of 13 and his three, I guess, incompletions were interceptions. Kenny Pickett didn't have an incomplete pass in his debut. And again, he didn't practice all week long. So there's your silver lining. I know you don't want to throw to the opposing team, but 10 of 13 in a debut when you didn't have a full week of practice to prepare as the starter, which is the reps that Mitch took. We'll see what happens moving forward. And it leads to, is there any argument that Trubisky should be the starter moving forward? Because I could tell you this as someone who's watched the first four games. I don't see any point. Trubisky hasn't shown through four games, anything. Because I go back to even the lone game that the Steelers have won this season, opening week against the Bengals. They win the turnover battle in that one 5-0, and they only win by three points in the fourth quarter. It's why they put Pickett in, because it's just like it got to a point where it's like this kid can't be worse than Trubisky has been. And when you get opportunity and chance after chance after chance after chance, to me, it's what do you do with those opportunities? And then your body language doesn't lie. And as soon as Pickett went into the game, there was a different energy, not just from the fans in the stadium, but also the players on the field. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I completely and totally agree. I don't see any reason to keep trying the Mitch Trubisky experiment. Quite honestly, if it in a, in a random dream scenario here, say you keep playing Mitch Trubisky and say he starts playing better. What does that do for you? What What is that, you know, where does that help the Steelers organization now and in the future? Because if Trubisky is playing average, he's still not playing good enough to be great or elite, which is where you would always want to have the quarterback position in the NFL. On top of that, he's keeping this first round rookie that you just drafted on the bench, taking away reps and opportunities for him to learn. Kenny Pickett, like it or not, is the future of this team, at least for the next handful of years. And whether it's going to start now going into week five after Mitch was benched at halftime, or it's going to start maybe the week after if they bring Mitch back or whenever it ends up officially starting, even though it seems likely that it already has started, that's the future of the Steelers. And so whether Kenny Pickett is good or bad, the Steelers need to find that out as soon as possible, because in the off chance that Kenny Pickett doesn't work out, now you have to go find someone else and you can't be wasting time treading water with a, an average to below average veteran quarterback that's looking for a home that has shown time and time again that they're not going to be able to perform well enough to stay in one spot for long enough. I don't see any reason to keep playing Trubisky. I think even if Kenny Pickett plays worse, he gets valuable experience. He gets to adjust to the speed of the game. He gets to build chemistry with the starting offense, and that's going to bode well for him in the future, even if this year ends up being pretty rocky. You got to be thinking beyond just this year if you're the Steelers. The chemistry portion, I think, is very underrated because other than George Pickens, he doesn't have the reps with Chase Claypool, Deontay Johnson, Pat Fryermuth that a regular starter would have that, say, Ben right. Roethlisberger had a year ago. 
Now, th- th- what you're experiencing in New York is the exact same reason why you draft Zach Wilson, because you look at the, the quarterback talent in the AFC and specifically the teams in your own division. You're accustomed exactly. to going against Tom Brady when he was in New England for years. You've got Josh Allen to deal with in the AFC East as well. I'm looking at it from the standpoint where it's like, look, just put this on paper. This season, which quarterback would you want to have? Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Deshaun Watson, Trubisky slash Pickett. I, I don't care how, what the upside is. I don't care if, if, if Trubisky or Pickett were playing at as high a level as they're capable of playing at this season. They're coming in fourth place in that argument every single time. So you've got to be able to keep up with the not only just the teams in the conference, but the teams in your own division. That's something you're yep. accustomed to in New York, and that's why you bring in Zach Wilson. That's why you have to be excited for him in year two. And I'll say this too. I was impressed by him, Andrew, because first start of the season, we knew that George Fant, the left tackle, wasn't going to play. So he's without his bodyguard on the offensive line. And – Coming back from a 10-point deficit on the road, I know this Steelers team, it's it's looking grim right now at 1-3 and three in Pittsburgh, but you, you had to be happy with what you saw from Zach Wilson to be able to rally his team back in this game. Double-digit deficit on the road. That's not easy. I don't care what the environment, I don't care what the level of talent is on this, on this Steelers team. No, I, the Steelers could be 0-15 and – a Creasier Field, formerly Heinz Field, is still going to be a terrible place to play for any opposing team that walks in the door. I don't care what people think, and maybe as a Steelers fan, Mark, you can correct me on this. I think Mike Tomlin's a heck of a coach. Uh, I think there's a lot of teams in the NFL that could do a heck of a lot worse than Mike Tomlin as a head coach. As a Jets fan, let me say, trust me, you can do a lot worse than Mike Tomlin as a head coach. We had Adam Gase for two years. So moving on from that, the Steelers, are in a good spot organizationally they have you know supported their fan base they have a head coach that the players rally behind and have full trust in they have a front office that seems to be very in sync with their coaching staff and when you have that sort of trust in your organization you can take risks you can afford to blow things up to build them back up from what they were and i think after you have a team that for so many years was the core of ben roethlisberger antonio brown you know uh Offensive line being strong, running game being strong, defense led by T.J. Watt and and Minka Fitzpatrick on the back end. That's all well and good, but now Roethlisberger's gone. You don't have Antonio Brown. Le'Veon Bell hasn't been in black and yellow for a long time now, and Najee Harris, as good as he is, is being hamstrung behind a bad offensive line. You got to find ways to get this offense a spark. You got to find ways to give this offense hope. And that goes for, like I said, you got to be thinking more than just right now, but you got, you can't give up on right now either. And you got to still build something off this season. And even if it's just experience and growth, if you're not doing well enough to grow or get a good experience, it's not going to matter. As a Jets fan, what I saw from Zach Wilson is the fruits of him playing as a rookie, because there was plenty of games as a rookie where Zach Wilson looked awful. There were plenty of games as a rookie where Zach Wilson really struggled. He would get down early and make a few mistakes, and that would be it. He wouldn't be able to get back into a rhythm or call himself back up. And you saw the growth from him now in year two, especially coming off an injury where he plays okay to start, has a bit of a dip through the middle of the game in the third quarter, and the fourth quarter comes around, and Zach Wilson came alive, and he woke up. And we saw, quite honestly, some of the best football he's played as a New York Jet on those last two drives in the fourth quarter to lead the Jets to a win. That's what, if you're the Steelers, you're hoping to see from Kenny Pickett. That's where you see, okay, we're playing this rookie. The situation around him may not be perfect, but we want to get him the experience now, get him adjusted to the speed of the game, let him learn on the job. So then going into year two, he can already be ahead of the schedule with the learning curve. And now we can work to surround the team with as much talent as possible to help him. Yeah, and I know the Steelers are without T.J. Watt, the reigning defensive player of the year. Pittsburgh has struggled to get after quarterbacks since Watt's injury, and that's you can't just replace a player like T.J. Watt. It's just not possible. But the Steelers' defense is also overly reliant upon Minka Fitzpatrick's wizardry, and he's a heck of a player on the back end. But in a certain sense, he's been so good, it's like, I would argue that other than kicker Chris Boswell, that he's been almost the Steelers' best offensive player. He almost had a pick six. He got ruled out. It set up a touchdown. Uh, he had a pick six in the opener as well. But it's just like, man, the Steelers' offense would look even worse with their average points per game if not for Fitzpatrick on the back end. 
And that's awfully concerning to me because it's just like you're going up against a Jets team where, again, second-year quarterback, first start of the season, it's like let's get after the quarterback. And I think considering all the injuries on the offensive line, the Jets did a pretty good job keeping him upright on Sunday. They did a solid job, but I'm going to be honest, Mark. I think more credit goes to Zach Wilson for making people miss in the pocket because Absolutely. the Steelers, in my opinion, were getting pressure and they were able to, to win home. Alex Highsmith came free at least three or four times around the edge on his matchups. Uh, even after their rookie right tackle, Max Mitchell, went down and they had another backup come in, Highsmith was doing damage on both sides. And I really thought this was an, an, an impressive game from Zach Wilson to be able to evade pressure, make people miss, get out of what should have been sacks, quite honestly, where he's dead to rights and his ability to move and escape and, and somehow dance around. As a Jets fan, we're sitting there going, no, 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 throw it away, throw it away, throw it away. And he's somehow still moving and finding a way to get out and find a way to escape. That isn't always going to happen. And quite honestly, just from what I've seen, and maybe this is like you said, we get wrapped up in our own bubbles of our teams and we don't always see the, the outside noise. But for, after watching Joe Flacco for three weeks, compared to where Zach Wilson was and his mobility in the pocket and ability to escape pressure, I think Zach Wilson might be one of the better quarterbacks in the league at it. Because there was a handful of times last game and even going back to last season where he should have been dead to rights. And somehow by some Houdini magic, he's able to escape and break out of the pocket and keep up and keep running. So for the Steelers pass rush from the outside looking in, I was I was scared of the Steelers pass rush, even without T.J. Watt. Larry Ogunjobi's a good player. Cam Hayward is all is Cam Hayward. We know all about Cam Hayward by now. You know, you still have Montrevious Adams at nose tackle. Alex Highsmith, mm -hmm. like I mentioned, played really well. I thought their pass rush did a solid job. Granted, I think the Jets' offensive line is very poor and maybe made them look a little better than they might be in reality. But I think you really got to give more credit to Zach Wilson for getting out of the pressure. And I think when it comes to the Steelers, it's about finishing the sacks, not so much getting to the quarterback, at least from what I saw last week, yesterday. Highsmith had a sack. He leads the NFL with five and a half on the season, but the Jets held Cam Hayward in check. And Hayward even said that this one was on the defense after the game. Uh, I know he had some sort of leg injury at the end of the game, but one TFL, zero sacks, zero quarterback hits. Like I know that quarterback hits and pressures aren't necessarily always an indicator if a defensive tackle is doing well, but if Watt is going to be out, Cam Hayward's the next guy that defenses are, or excuse me, opposing uh, offenses are going to key on. And I'd like to see a little bit more production from Hayward in Watt's absence. But Highsmith still leading the league in sacks. We'll see what happens here on Monday Night Football tonight. But five and a half, he's been really good off the edge. But the thing with Watt is the Steelers consistently line him up over an opposing team's right tackle. Most quarterbacks in this league are right handed. So that is very deliberate uh, for where they lock, line up Watt on the field. And he's disruptive and makes plays regardless of if you double team him, triple team him. And he's again, he's not the type of player where you can just plug and play with next man up. It's, it's just not going to be that simple. Uh, Andrew, I wanted to ask you uh, near the end of the first half, how mad were you at the roughing the passer penalty on Mitch Trubisky, which set up a 59 yard Chris Boswell field goal to end the first half on Sunday. Uh, I wasn't mad that they called the penalty. I was mad at Carl Lawson for hitting Trubisky in that situation. Yeah. I, that, I'm not, I'm not egregious. I'm not going to sit here and be like, Oh, the refs are terrible or no, this isn't football. There's been plenty of times when that has happened. And that is the case. This wasn't one of them. You got to know it's the end of the half. It's a hail Mary situation. And if you're Carl Lawson, I'm not even breathing on Trubisky. I'm playing contained to make sure that he doesn't just get a free scramble to maybe get in field goal range or try something silly with a one second on the clock. But outside of that, I'm not worried about it. And the second I see Tr Mitch loading up to throw, that's my cue to back off. So I, I really wasn't. I was way more upset at Carl Lawson, who's a veteran who should know better than I was at the refs for throwing the flag, quite honestly. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, it was like, <laughs> this is the only way we're going to score uh, yeah. in the first down because it was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. And Boswell's, other than Justin Tucker, I'd argue he's as good as there is in this league from the kicker absolutely. standpoint. I'll say this too, from a Steelers standpoint too, uh, Gunnar Osheski, punt returner, 
This is now the second time in four weeks where he had a botched punt in the New England Patriots game in a scenario where the Steelers only had 10 men on the field. He had a fumble on a punt yesterday trying to make a play. I understand that, but very nearly flipped the field and the Steelers were able to recover. Steelers turned the ball over four times in this game. They the two fumbles they recovered, but two times in four weeks, if you're a punt returner, like the Steelers have to be monitoring that very, very closely because I get the upside of having a player who has been a pro bowler back there before, but if he's turning the ball over and you can flip the field on a dime and points have been a premium for the Steelers offense, it's something that they need to watch I'd give him a few more weeks, but two times out of four weeks where that was a key moment in the game with the Steelers recovery. But I I was freaking out to where it's like, not this again, because right now with how bad the offense has been been in Pittsburgh, the defense and special teams have had to play almost perfect. And Sunday's game goes to show you where sometimes you're going to have some give from your defense. You got to play complimentary football. Steelers defense didn't get it done but at least the offense gave them a chance and put them in a position to win. Uh, I'll say this too. Uh, Another guy, both Ike Taylor and I were very high on coming out of the draft. Brees Hall, I think he got a really, a stud running back out of Iowa State. And he was able to get it done, reach across the goal line, just a gritty, gritty run. I think he's a do-it-all back. What we really liked coming out of the draft is his ability to catch the ball out of the backfield. But What did you see from him on Sunday? Because I think he's starting to make a name for himself. And again, it comes as no surprise from our standpoint. He's someone we really, really liked in this past year's draft. Well, well, you guys aren't alone in that uh, in that aspect. Lamont Jordan, my co-host over on Believe in Jets, who's a former pro running back himself, loves Brees Hall, was absolutely shouting his praises from the rooftops when we were leading up to the draft in the spring, going over the potential that the Jets might add a running back. Neither of us thought that they would take one as early as they did. But Lamont was adamant. Hall's the best running back in this draft, and it wasn't even close. I was a Kenneth Walker guy myself. I had them as kind of 1A, 1B. But... Not going to sit here and say that I didn't think Brees Hall was a talented player because he absolutely is. And being in New York, he's their running back one now. He's overtaken Michael Carter. If you just look at the snap counts, Carter usually starts the game. But as the game goes on, Brees Hall is seeing the field more. And he's been morphed into more of their bell cow. And we're seeing a lot of the same stuff from him, good and bad, I think, that translated from his Iowa State game. Uh, He's still incredibly quick and explosive while also being six feet tall and 220 pounds. So there's, you know, height, weight, speed. You got that going for you in spades. His ability to change direction, I think, is very, very underrated. I think it's what helps him be a receiver in the passing game is that he can cut running routes just like he can cut with the ball in his hands. And that's definitely a big help. He's been better at running between the tackles than I expected early. He's able to put his shoulder down a little bit and fight for tough yards. We saw in that game-winning touchdown, he breaks a tackle in the backfield and is able to keep churning and and stick his hand out and break the plane for the score. So there's a lot to like from that aspect as well. I'm, I am hopeful for Brees Hall. The only thing I'm waiting for, and this is quite honestly, this is exactly why I had Kenneth Walker over him coming out of the draft. There's a little bit of hesitation with him where when he gets in the backfield, sometimes he has a lane to the outside or he has a lane to the inside, but it's not quite wide open for him. And he's a little too patient and hesitant and slowing his momentum before reading what's happening and then exploding through the hole. You could get away with that at Iowa State when you're the fastest guy on the field in every game. In the NFL, it's a little bit different because guys are so much faster as well. But that's going to come with experience. And I think as time goes on, Brees is going to get even better. I think this is a perfect scheme fit for him offensively in terms of the wide zone at its core and then how he's going to get used in the passing game. I think that'll be a big help. And I wanted to ask you this, Mark. It's kind of yeah. off topic, but while we're while we're getting here, we're talking about running backs and we're talking about pass catching running backs. Why don't the Steelers throw to Najee Harris? Why does it seem like he is not a factor in their passing game? Because he was a great receiver at Alabama, and that was part of his like whole draw is that here's this awesome 230-pound power back who catches passes like a receiver, and the Jets suck at defending running backs in the pass game. So I was really – I was shocked that there was very little, you know, uh, effort – for lack of a better word, to get Najee Harris the ball. And by your reaction, I'm guessing that you have a pretty good answer for me. Well, there is a long list of criticisms with Steelers offensive coordinator Matt Canada and Andrew. Exactly. Let's just add that to the list of criticisms. I, I will say this. 
I liked how they have gotten and made it a priority the last two weeks to get George Pickens, the rookie receiver out of Georgia, the ball. Pickens goes for more than 100 yards on Sunday. And Pickens, you could see right away, has more chemistry with Pickett. His level of production in one half with Kenny Pickett has been better than three and a half games with Mitch Trubisky. But, yeah, when you have Najee Harris, who's a do-it-all back, he's not just a pass catcher, he's not just a runner, he's also a great uh, pass protection blocker as well he, he's a do-it-all back it's the reason why he's a first round pick a year ago out of alabama add it to a long list of criticisms that you would have of yeah. matt canada i don't know if matt canada has the the personnel up front and the steelers offensive line has been decimated because marquise pouncey retires about a year ago david DeCastro, an all pro at guard wears down with injuries and the steelers need to let him go DeCastro was the last player that the Steelers drafted on the offensive line in either the first or the second round of the NFL draft. And that was in 2012. So it's yeah, almost like a long when time you ago. All, yeah, he was, he you was eat, Andrew Luck's teammate at Stanford. If that says anything, there you go. And it's almost like when you stock up on groceries and you stay home and you eat and you stay home and you eat and you stay home and eat, the cupboard's going to be bare after a certain point and you've got to be able to restock and replenish. And it's what the Steelers are seeing on the offensive line right now. Like it's, I I don't want to throw Matt Canada under the bus and say it is all on him because you're only as good as the the sum of your parts, but like the sum hasn't equaled the parts where, okay, two years ago when Chase Claypool's a rookie, he ties a franchise record with 11 touchdowns. Deontay Johnson was a pro bowler last year filling in because Jamar Chase was in the Super Bowl. Same thing with Najee Harris filling in for Joe Mixon at the running back position. He was a pro bowler a year ago. Pat Frymuth was winning one-on-one combat catches when Ben would toss it up to him, and he was looking like a stud a year ago as a rookie. George Pickens has shown flashes in the preseason. Like, yeah. where, where is this collectively? And it is something that right. I saw when Pickett went into the game. At least this offense had a pulse. And through three and a half games right. with Mitch, I just haven't seen it. So – to answer your question, Andrew, about why not get Najee Harris going in in the out, pass catching the ball out of the backfield. To me, it's an easy way to create mismatches where he can outrun a linebacker. And then if you want to put a DB on him, get him the ball quickly and he can overpower and just run over a DB or he's got a ferocious stiff arm. He can jump over guys. To me, that's a no brainer. But again, long list of criticisms of an offense that has just been it's been broken this year. Point blank period. It has been broken. Yeah. So that's where I land with that. Yeah, no, I, I completely I understand. That. Believe me, I could sit here and go through the laundry list of things over the Jets first couple of games that they didn't do correctly offensively. And there's a, a bit of a mirror, quite honestly, between the Steelers and the Jets. The Steelers have been struggling to run the ball all year. And I don't think it's because of Najee Harris. I think it's because of their offensive line and because they lack the vertical threat downfield in the passing game, not so much at the receiver position, but at quarterback taking advantage of those receivers, that teams can load the box. They can key in on runs on early downs. And that's really hard when you're a running back running behind a bad offensive line to get gener- to po- generate positive yards in the pros when everyone knows you're running and no one can block for you. So I really it- thought that would be a way to loosen up teams on early downs, throw Najee the ball and make it work like a run play. If he gets six yards in the flat, who cares? That's the, you know, keep yourself ahead of the chains. It's, it used to be old school where you'd run the ball to set up the pass in 2022. I think it's the opposite where you, you pass to set up the run and to keep defenses honest. And that's where downfield where you have Chase Claypool, who's six, four prior who's a big guy and has demonstrated the ability to win one-on-one scenarios that's why when Pickett's very first throw, he throws interception up to Chase Claypool. I have no problem with that. It's what f- forty yards down the field. No, it's a and he's throwing pulse. it on five foot eight Lamarcus Joyner at free safety. So that's like that's the this was an incredible play by Joyner to be outsized by Claypool yes. and go up and tip the ball and give an opportunity for Jordan Whitehead to pick it off. But that's if I'm Kenny Pickett, I'm going. I have a six four receiver on a five eight safety. I like that matchup. I'm going to trust my guy at 6'4 to go up and win. That's not a, a, a of a decision by any means, in my opinion, on Pickett. You should be getting on Chase Claypool for not boxing out a 5'8 safety. Sure, sure. And that's where, when I mentioned the uh, Pickett-Pickens connection, 14 quarters with Trubisky, 
Seven for 16, 96 yards to George Pickens. Two quarters with pickets. Four of four, 71 yards. So it's just like, it's not just what my eyes are telling me, Andrew. The stats back it yep. up as well. And it's like, okay, so what happens when Pickett can develop a rapport with Deontay Johnson yep. and with Chase Claypool and he gets those reps? That's why I hope we see Pickett moving forward. And I hope we don't go through this whole charade of, oh, who's the quarterback? And it was only for one game because – the schedule is not getting any easier for the Steelers in the coming weeks up until the bye week. It is a gauntlet in the next four games. But before we get there, I want to go through a few other week four observations from the NFL across the NFL. Chiefs beat the Bucks last night on Sunday night football. I want to say this, Andrew. I deeply discounted Patrick Mahomes' ability to get his team fired up because the last time they played the Buccaneers was in the Super Bowl at Raymond James Stadium, and there was no way they were going to lose last night. As soon as I, as soon as they came on, I saw how animated and fired up both Mahomes and Kelsey was. It was like I felt like an idiot for picking the Bucks on <laughs> Sunday Night Football. Oh yeah, um, Pat Mahomes, man. People sometimes we need to go back and stop, and you have those moments where you realize what you're actually watching, and we're watching one of the best quarterbacks in the history of the league. We're watching a guy that's going to go down when he retires like an Elway or like a Marino. And and he is going to be fully willing uh, of being in that category. I'm Patrick Mahomes for me, I, I quite honestly, I think he's the best quarterback in the league. Josh Allen is fantastic in a very, yeah. very close second. And you. it might I'm be my you. Jets bias holding him off from, from number two. But Pat Mahomes has the special ability to always find the open man when he needs to at the very most important times where very rarely do you see Pat Mahomes get into a situation where he has nowhere to go with the ball and he doesn't have an answer whatsoever. And he just throws a prayer and hopes for the best. His prayers are calculated. His prayers are deliberate <laughs> where, where he goes, okay, I'm falling away. I'm on my back foot. There's three guys in my face and, and, and there's Travis Kelsey. He's got two guys on him, but he's got a half of a step and a slight bit of outside leverage. That's all I need. Let's, you know, off my back foot, over the head, perfect ball. Boom. Pat Mahomes is a magician. I'm not the first one to call him that. I'm not breaking any news or, or, or uncovering anything crazy by saying, being over here saying Pat Mahomes is great, but I, I just get more and more blown away by it every single time it happens. And I go back to 2017 when he was coming out in the draft where I kept watching him and Pat Mahomes quite honestly changed my quarterback evaluations because I used to be more of a do it by the book, be in rhythm. We're looking for the surgical type of pocket passers who can go out and, and keep the offense on schedule. And I saw Pat Mahomes tape in college and I'm going, oh, he can just throw anywhere he wants at any time. And it doesn't matter if you pressure him and he drops back 14 yards, he's still throwing down the field. That's a superhuman skill. I don't know if there's many other people in the NFL that can play like that. Josh Allen included. Uh, it's You can count them on one hand and, and it might not even be that many. So look out rest of the NFL because we got some dangerous, dangerous quarterbacks in the AFC. My logic when I picked the Bucks was Todd Bowles, figured out Mahomes with the two high safeties and slowing down a Chiefs offense that at the time had Tyreek Hill. And I'm like, well, Tyreek Hill's gone now. And this was the Buccaneers defense that held the Chiefs to nine points in the Super Bowl. First time that they're playing. I know that the rosters aren't quite all the same, but this is what I didn't realize. It's not just everything that you described with Mahomes. Mahomes with a much upgraded offensive line. Mahomes with time yes. in the pocket to throw the ball is the scariest thing in all of the NFL. And it why sure we why we question, oh, well, let's pick the Broncos, the Raiders, or the Chargers is the sexy upset pick in the AFC West. Why do we do this? Why do we do yeah. this? So it was Wasn't just on me. display yet again. I, I had yeah. the Chiefs in the Super Bowl this year, so it didn't find me in that crowd. Speaking of the Bills. Crazy comeback win against the Ravens. Ravens led by 17 points against the Bills. Week two, the Ravens had a 21-point lead against the Dolphins. I thought this was the team that was supposed to be able to run the ball and run out the clock. Ravens lose both of those games. Now, the Ravens joined the 2011 Vikings, only team to lose multiple games after leading by 17 points within their first four games. I knew this was going to be a showdown, but 
we see Josh Allen's wizardry yet again, and they pull one out on the road in Baltimore. Heck of a game and heck of a finish. I hope we get to see this, this matchup again come playoff time because this was just a heck of a game on Sunday afternoon. I wouldn't be shocked at all if we see this game again in the playoffs. I think you have two teams in the Ravens and the Bills that are very, very talented, that are very, very well coached, that have great quarterbacks leading them and have strong defenses that can make plays when it counts to keep them in games. That's a recipe for playoff football. I think you're going to see those two definitely as one of the seven that gets out of the AFC when we get to January. Sticking to Buffalo in particular, I think they're the best team in the league. And I don't even think it's close. I don't even know who I would put as the number two behind them right now because offensively, defensively, special teams, the whole collective phase, coaching included, I don't know if there's a a squad that's assembled better. And you it shows in games like this. How many other teams in the NFL can get down 17 points and still win? How how many other teams can, can get down 17 points against the Baltimore Ravens and still win? Not many. And I really think on top of Josh Allen and how incredible he is, which, you know, he's an alien, like talking about Mahomes, we don't need to say anything that's already been said before. But I want to give credit to Sean McDermott because I don't hear nearly enough people talking about the job that Sean McDermott has done as head coach of the Buffalo Bills. He comes in in his very first season, goes nine and seven and takes the Bills to the playoffs for the first time in something like 15 years. And the Bills have been a powerhouse ever since. They draft Josh Allen. There's a slight learning curve his rookie year, second year improvement. They make the playoffs third year. He's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL fourth year. They look like the best team in the NFL where, and no one wants to say Sean McDermott's the top five head coach. No one wants to say Sean McDermott is even mentioned among some of the greats. I brought up Mike Tomlin earlier and the, the, Mm -hmm. the pedigree that he's earned over his coaching career, which again, I think is very warranted for Tomlin. But I also think McDermott deserves a lot of that same praise and the collective team that he has built. You know how hard it is to have a team in the NFL with arguably the best offense and arguably the best defense at the same time? (laughs) How often does that happen when you can sit there and say that one team has probably the best offense and probably the best defense in the league? How are you supposed to combat that? That, to me, goes to coaching. The Bills have had... Uh, credit to GM Brandon Bean as well, but Sean McDermott, man, it's time we give this guy his flowers. He's really earned it. If you're a Bills fan, you're just hoping that this team doesn't peak too soon. And I know they've had some injuries on the defensive side of the ball, safety position, but I'll, I'll say this about McDermott. You go back to when it matters in the playoffs, 13 seconds left against the Chiefs. Can you get back to that point again? And then can you win when you're in that position again? And then I'll give you your flowers because regular season and getting this team to the postseason, I'm with you. But with the NFL, it's what have you done for me recently and come playoff time. That's what people are going to point to. And that would be, I guess, the argument against McDermott. I'm I'm with you with the Bills. I think you could make an argument about the Chiefs. I think you could maybe make an argument about the Eagles. And this is where I wanted to ask you with the Eagles, the only undefeated team left in the NFL at 4-0. How long do they stay undefeated for in the coming weeks? Because I'm looking at their schedule. I'll read this to you. Next Sunday against the Cardinals, week after against the Cowboys. Then they've got the Steelers, the Texans, the Commanders, and the Colts. I'm looking at that on paper, and I'm like, they've got to be favored in every single one of those games. So how long can the Eagles keep this thing rolling? They certainly probably will be favored in all of those games. But I'll tell you what. The NFC East is is its own tricky animal uh, with how that division works. And once you get into division games, everything else goes out the window. That's when we've seen crazy Cowboys teams that look like, you know, they're going to roll their way into the playoffs. They play the Giants on Sunday night football in a division game, and all of a sudden the Giants look great. Or, you know, the Commanders play terrible all year, and all of a sudden they go into Philadelphia, and that's when they wake up. So, I'm looking at that game against the Cowboys. One, because we got to be honest, the Cowboys are playing well. They're a good team in their own right. Cooper Rush is undefeated as a starter. Is playing plenty good football. Yeah, playing plenty good football to keep their offense going afloat. Uh, I would like for my fantasy team's purposes for them to give Tony Pollard the ball more, but that's a discussion (laughs) for another uh, another day. 
Either way, I think the Cowboys are going to be their best shot at a loss. I'm not going to come out and say, yes, the Dallas Cowboys are going to beat the Eagles. But of those next four games, I think that's the one where they could potentially see some trouble. And I could see the Cowboys irking out a win, knocking the Eagles out of undefeated. The Eagles are going to be a problem for most of this year, if not all of it. I'm with you. I've got the Eagles as the top team in the NFC right now. That's just where I'm at. And Jalen Hurts and company have been balling. they got two stud receivers. And I mean, like we could talk till sundown about how good this Eagles team's looked. The Jags team, by the way, too. I think the Jags are pretty good in the AFC South. A few other things I want to discuss, though. Uh, Carolina Panthers. I know Matt Rule wouldn't rule out benching Baker Mayfield in the coming weeks. I think Rule is a lame duck walking. And I'm going to say this, too. Benching Baker Mayfield in favor of Sam Darnold is not going to save your job. Point blank period. No. And like, I like it's no knock on Sam Darnold or Baker Mayfield, but Mayfield is a better quarterback than Sam Darnold. And if Darnold does end up getting the start, you are going to see this. Mark my words here. We're recording this on October the 3rd. Mark my words. You can come back to this clip after the fact. But if Darnold gets the start over Mayfield, it's not going to solve anything for the Panthers. No, not at all. You're talking to a Jets fan. I don't need to see anything more out of Sam Darnold to know that he is not going to be capable of leading that team to any sort of success. Uh, if, ba if Baker can't do it, then Darnold definitely can't do it. And quite honestly, I don't think that while neither of the quarterbacks are necessarily good or have played well during their time in the pros, it's not just on them. I think the offensive system as a whole is struggling. I think their offensive line has been struggling and was struggling last year. First round pick Iki Iquanu has been having a rough go of it his first few games in the NFL. He's really adjusting the speed of the game, and that's really putting a damper on things. And when you have really looking at like we were talking about with the Steelers before, you have Chase Claypool and George Pickens and a great running back and Najee Harris, and you have talent, you have weapons, you have threatening opportunities on offense. But where's the collective vision for it? How does it all fit together and how does it all work out? Well, it's the same sort of thing in Carolina. You have Robbie Anderson. You have DJ Moore. You have Christian McCaffrey. You have a couple of good tight ends. Tommy Tremble's a good player. I know they have another. Uh, Ian Thomas is a solid tight end. They have weapons on this offense. They have talent on this offense. I mean, I couldn't even. Terrace Marshall. I loved Terrace Marshall coming out from LSU. He's their number three receiver. There's a bunch of talent on this team. But where is the cohesive vision to kind of keep it all together and form a unit as opposed to just a collection of players? When you don't have the quarterback that can distribute the ball and you don't have the head coach in place that can set the ship and, and give your collective vision for everyone to follow, it makes things hard. I, hand, hand up, yeah, calling out myself here. Boy, was I wrong on Matt Rule because I wanted him as Jets head coach when Adam Gase got fired, and I am okay. praising my lucky stars they got Robert Sala. <laughs> and, and they kept the year Matt Rule went to Carolina, the Jets kept Gase for another year, and that worked out in the end. But boy, was I hoping for him to come to New York, and boy, am I glad that didn't happen. I'm glad to see someone else. I'll admit when I'm wrong, too, or it's just like, oh, hey, yeah. you know, we're not going to no one bats a thousand. I thought Rule, year three and Temple, he turned things around in year three. And Baylor, he turned things around in year three. I was like, maybe at the Panthers this season. Uh, he, Still got all a few he did was left, rebuild programs man. in college. Yeah, all he did was build that, teams up from nothing in college. But the NFL is not college. One other thing, and some would argue that we're burying the lead here, Andrew. Return of the double doink. Vikings beat the Saints <laughs> in the U.K., the international fans are going nuts. They like the kicking game even more than they like the offense and defensive action. Cody Parkey's got to be thanking his lucky stars. He's no longer the only one. 61-yard field goal, double doink on Sunday in the UK. To me, that was like the biggest highlight of anything that happened on Sunday. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, no, I had a lot more fun waking up uh, this early in, on October Sunday to watch that happen as opposed to last year when the Jets got killed by the Falcons in London. That was a much better uh, opportunity for me. But no, that's nothing better than that. Nothing better than everything down on the line. When, when you get to watch teams that you don't care about, it's the most fun being an NFL fan. When you're not invested yeah. in what's happening whatsoever and the hilarity that can ensue doesn't affect you, it's the best time in the world. So it, 11 a.m. on a Sunday watching a double doink, nothing better than that. That is Andrew Golden from Believe in Jets. In the coming weeks, the Steelers have the Buffalo Bills on the road, 13-point underdog in week five.
Your Jets are going to be hosting the Miami Dolphins. That's low key. Going to be one of the best games in week five. Go ahead and plug your show, any of the social media channels that you would like. I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you so much, Andrew, Andrew, for coming on, but plug anything you would like here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you so much, Mark, for having me. This was a blast to definitely have to come on in the future. If we get towards the draft time, we can get into get in some fun stuff there. That's really where I think my focus is mainly is on covering the draft and how that affects the NFL. But on top of that, you guys want to follow the show on our end. You can follow at B-L-E-A-V underscore in underscore Jets on Twitter. Search the show on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, et cetera. And that's going to be on B-L-E-A-V in Jets as well. You can find me personally if you want to follow me for some reason at Andrew Golden underscore 17 on Twitter. You can follow my co-host Lamont Jordan at Coach Jordan 34. Uh, and on top of that, just keep an eye peeled as we're going to be releasing episodes twice a week, going through recapping the year. And I cannot wait already. I'm looking forward to the draft. It's going to be a lot of fun for a draft season once when we really get things into high gear, break down all these prospects, look ahead to the NFL in 2023. Hey, I know you got Josh Allen in your division. I know you're at two and two right now, but don't count out Jets in the playoffs. I'm just saying could happen. Could happen. I'm never say never. After week two in Cleveland, I've learned never say never. For my guest, Andrew Golden, I am Mark Bergen. Thank you for watching the Believe in Steelers show. I'll be back later this week to preview Steelers in Bills. Until then, take care and so long, everybody.